Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I have gathered three horror stories for you to listen to. I hope you enjoy them. If you love stories like these, please give us a like. And if you want to support the channel, please subscribe. Thank you so much for all the support. Now, on with the stories. In 1986, a brutal crime shook Los Angeles and would ultimately remain unresolved for over two decades, its dark truths buried beneath layers of misplaced leads and overlooked evidence. This story starts with a woman named Sherry Rasmussen, an accomplished 29-year-old nursing director known for her compassion, dedication, and success. As a leader at Glendale Adventist Medical Center, Sherry had devoted her life to helping others, guiding her staff, and caring deeply for her patients. She was the kind of person people gravitated toward, and her life seemed like it was on the path to continued happiness. In 1985, Sherry found love with John Reuton, a mechanical engineer who shared her values and her excitement for the future. The two married that year, moving into a condo in Van Nuys, ready to build a life together. But unknown to Sherry, her life with John would be haunted by a shadow from his past, a shadow that would grow darker and more menacing with time. That shadow was Stephanie Lazarus. Stephanie and John had dated casually during their college years at UCLA, and while John had moved on, Stephanie had not. Now, Stephanie wasn't just any ex-girlfriend. She was a respected officer with the Los Angeles Police Department. After learning about John's engagement to Sherry, Stephanie's behavior began to raise red flags, particularly for Sherry. There were encounters where Stephanie showed up unexpectedly, and one incident even saw Stephanie appear at Sherry's workplace, attempting to convince her to end her relationship with John. According to Sherry's father, Nels Rasmussen, Sherry had expressed deep concerns about Stephanie's behavior, and he encouraged her to take her worries to the police. Yet despite her unease, Sherry didn't imagine just how much of a threat Stephanie could be. On February 24, 1986, Sherry Rasmussen stayed home from work, planning to spend a quiet day at home. When her husband John returned that evening, he found a disturbing scene that would haunt him forever. Sherry was dead, her body showing clear signs of a violent struggle. She had been beaten and shot, and a bite mark was found on her arm, a significant detail that would later serve as a critical clue. Investigators arrived and initially theorized that this had been a burglary gone wrong. Sherry's BMW was missing, and some electronic items had been stacked near the front door. The theory was that burglars had broken in, and in a moment of desperation, things had turned fatal. Her car was found a week later, but it didn't bring any new leads. Nels Rasmussen was relentless in his push for answers. He was convinced that Stephanie Lazarus was somehow involved, but at the time, the LAPD didn't give his suspicions much weight. Sherry's case quickly went cold, slipping into the backlog of unsolved cases. The possibility of Stephanie's involvement was not pursued, and the bite mark evidence, which could have been telling, was largely ignored. For the next two decades, Sherry's family was left to wrestle with grief and frustration, waiting for a breakthrough that seemed less likely with each passing year. In 2009, technology offered a second chance for Sherry's case. Advancements in DNA analysis allowed detectives to re-examine old evidence, including the bite mark on Sherry's arm. When they ran the DNA test, they made a startling discovery. The DNA from the bite mark didn't belong to a male suspect. It matched a female. This changed everything. In the course of reviewing old case files, investigators stumbled upon Stephanie Lazarus's name and her connection to John Rewitton. With suspicions finally reignited, detectives placed Stephanie under discreet surveillance. They needed a clean DNA sample, something that would confirm what they were beginning to suspect. Eventually, they got what they needed from a discarded cup, and when they compared that sample to the DNA from the crime scene, it was a match. On June 5, 2009, Stephanie Lazarus was arrested and charged with the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. During her trial, the prosecution argued that Stephanie, unable to let go of her past with John, confronted Sherry that day in a jealous rage. She used her skills and training as an officer to cover her tracks, staging the scene to look like a burglary gone wrong, but her calculated actions couldn't erase the DNA evidence or the lingering suspicions of Sherry's family. After a three-week trial, Stephanie was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to 27 years to life in prison. The case of Sherry Rasmussen's murder shocked Los Angeles not only because of the crime itself, 
but because of what it revealed about the potential for oversight and bias within the LAPD. The department was forced to confront the uncomfortable reality that one of their own had committed a heinous act and that the investigation had potentially suffered because of that connection. This case served as a grim reminder of the need for accountability and thoroughness, even when the suspect is a respected member of the very system tasked with upholding the law. Stephanie Lazarus remains in prison today, with parole hearings that continue to bring back the painful memories for Sherry's family, who never gave up their search for justice. Sherry Rasmussen's story stands as a testament to the persistence of truth and the lengths loved ones will go to ensure that justice is served, even when the odds seem stacked against them. In the heart of Sydney, Australia, in the quiet suburb of Blacktown, 26-year-old Anita Kabi lived a life that anyone would describe as bright and full of promise. Anita was known not only for her gentle nature and striking beauty, but also for her dedication to her profession. A registered nurse, she worked long shifts caring for patients at Sydney Hospital, often going above and beyond to ensure they felt comfortable and safe. Her compassion and warmth made her a beloved figure among both her colleagues and patients. Beyond her career, Anita had once competed in beauty pageants, winning the Miss Western Suburbs title. But despite her brief brush with glamour, Anita's real calling was always her work as a nurse and her love for family and friends. Her future seemed open and filled with potential. Yet fate had a different plan, and what happened to Anita Kabi would become one of Australia's most haunting cases, one that stirred national outrage and led to calls for justice that reverberated across the country. On the evening of February 2, 1986, Anita had just finished a long shift at the hospital. It was a Sunday night, and like many other nights, she made her way to a nearby restaurant to meet a few friends for dinner. After an enjoyable meal and conversation, Anita prepared to make her way home. She caught a train to Blacktown, where she would typically phone her father for a ride. But when she arrived at the station, the payphone she relied on was out of order. Left with little choice, she began the walk from the station to her parents' home. The path along Newton Road was quiet, with only the occasional street lamp casting pools of light on the dimly lit sidewalks. Anita knew this walk well. It was familiar to her, a journey she'd made before. But on that night, as she walked alone through the suburban silence, a dark and ominous fate was closing in. While Anita was walking, five men prowling the streets in a stolen vehicle caught sight of her. They were John Travers, Michael Murdoch, and brothers Michael, Gary, and Leslie Murphy. Their intentions were far from innocent. The group, spiraling into a dangerous world of crime and violence, seized this tragic opportunity when they saw Anita. She was forcibly taken into their vehicle, and from that point, her fate was sealed. The group drove Anita to a remote area on the outskirts of the city, a location hidden from any possible witnesses, where they subjected her to a prolonged and harrowing experience before leaving her alone in the cold, dark field. Two days later, Anita's body was discovered by a local farmer. News of the murder spread quickly, shocking the community and soon the entire nation. The peaceful suburb of Blacktown would never be the same. The investigation that followed was one of the most exhaustive manhunts in Australian history. Detectives worked around the clock, driven by the intensity of the crime and the overwhelming demand for justice. Leads were scarce at first, and the community held its breath, hoping for a breakthrough. Finally, a critical tip came in from an informant, a person familiar with John Travers, who pointed investigators in the right direction. This information broke the case open, leading authorities to the five men responsible for Anita's death. When the truth of their actions became public, the reaction was swift and filled with anger. These five men were apprehended and brought to trial. The case was so distressing that few people who heard the details could remain unmoved. In 1987, the trial ended with a verdict that would ensure the men would never see freedom again. All five were convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. In the aftermath of the tragedy, Australia was left to grapple with the impact of Anita Cobby's murder. The brutal nature of the crime left an indelible mark on the nation's consciousness, and there was a strong public outcry for the reinstatement of the death penalty. But perhaps the most profound response came from Anita's family. Gary and Grace Lynch, her grieving parents, transformed their unimaginable pain into a mission to help others. 
they founded the Homicide Victim Support Group, an organization dedicated to supporting families affected by violent crime. Through this group, they provided comfort and assistance to countless individuals facing similar tragedies. Anita's legacy lived on through this organization, offering a glimmer of hope and community support in the wake of unthinkable loss. To this day, the memory of Anita Kabi is a reminder of both the darkness that exists in the world and the resilience of those who fight to bring light back into it. Her story has become a symbol of the need for community vigilance, the importance of supporting victims of violent crime, and the power of compassion to heal even the deepest wounds. Australia's collective memory holds Anita close, a painful but necessary reminder of the importance of justice and the enduring strength of the human spirit. In the quiet town of Belen, New Mexico, a place where everyone knew each other and life flowed at a slow and predictable pace, an unsettling mystery unfolded in 1988. Tara Calico, a vibrant and athletic 19-year-old, had no idea her ordinary day would mark the beginning of a mystery that would haunt her family, friends, and law enforcement for decades to come. She was known for her love of the outdoors and her routine morning bike rides along New Mexico State Road 47. Tara's family was close-knit, especially with her mother, Patty Duell. Their bond was strong, and they shared a unique sense of trust and understanding. So when Tara borrowed her mother's neon pink Huffy mountain bike for her ride, a bike easy to spot due to its bright color, Patty thought nothing of it. It was a day like any other, or so it seemed. That morning, September 20th, 1988, Tara set out on her bicycle as usual, around 9.30 a.m., she planned to return by noon to meet her boyfriend for a tennis match later in the day. Before leaving, she reminded Patty of a simple instruction. If she wasn't back by noon, her mother should come looking for her. This had happened before, as Tara's love for the open road often led her to lose track of time. Patty, familiar with her daughter's carefree spirit, agreed to the arrangement without a second thought. By noon, however, Tara hadn't returned. Patty, keeping her promise, set off to search for her daughter along the route. She drove along the highway, calling out for her, checking the sides of the road, and looking for any sign of Tara's bike. But there was nothing. As the hours passed, Patty's worry deepened. She contacted the authorities, and a search party quickly mobilized, scouring every inch of the route Tara had taken. In the days following her disappearance, witnesses came forward, recounting seeing Tara riding her bike that morning. Some claimed they saw a light-colored pickup truck, perhaps a Ford from the 1950s, following close behind her along the highway. This strange detail piqued investigators' curiosity, but also added a disturbing layer to the case. Had Tara encountered trouble on her ride? Could someone in that vehicle have played a role in her vanishing? Then, a small yet haunting clue emerged. Pieces of Tara's Sony Walkman and a cassette tape were discovered scattered along the road she had traveled. Patty and others who knew Tara well believed she might have left these items on purpose, marking a trail to help someone find her. It was a chilling thought that Tara might have known she was in danger. But despite intensive efforts by search teams, neither Tara nor her distinctive pink bicycle were ever found. Months went by with little progress. But in June 1989, nearly a year after Tara's disappearance, an eerie new clue surfaced, this time hundreds of miles away in Port St. Joe, Florida. In the parking lot of a convenience store, a Polaroid photograph was found that shocked and puzzled everyone who saw it. The photo showed a young woman and a boy lying in the back of a van, both bound and gagged. The girl in the photo bore a striking resemblance to Tara, down to a scar on her leg, one Tara had received from a childhood accident. Near her in the picture was a copy of the novel My Sweet Audrina by V.C. Andrews, a book that had been a personal favorite of Tara's. News of the photograph spread quickly, capturing national attention. Many, including Tara's mother Patty, believed it was her. Experts were brought in to analyze the photograph, and the opinions varied widely. Scotland Yard in the United Kingdom concluded that the woman in the photograph was Tara, while the Los Alamos National Laboratory, a U.S. government facility, disagreed. Meanwhile, the FBI, after conducting their own analysis, found the results inconclusive. The photograph remained a chilling mystery, fueling speculation and hope, but also deepening the anguish for Tara's loved ones. Years passed, 
and with each passing year, the questions about what happened to Tara only grew louder. Then, in 2008, the case took another turn. Valencia County Sheriff Rene Rivera announced that he had information suggesting a group of teenage boys had accidentally hit Tara with their truck on the day she disappeared. In a panic, Rivera claimed, they covered up the accident, hiding her body to escape any consequences. But without concrete evidence or a confession, the sheriff's theory remained just that, a theory. Rivera's claim stirred up both hope and frustration in Tara's family and the community as they grappled with the idea that those responsible for her disappearance might still be out there, walking free. In June 2023, an unexpected announcement breathed new life into Tara's case. The Valencia County Sheriff's Office revealed that they had gathered sufficient evidence to present the investigation to the District Attorney's Office for review, potentially bringing criminal charges against those involved. The details of this new evidence and the identities of any suspects were kept under tight wraps, sealed by the court to protect the integrity of the ongoing investigation. Sheriff Denise Vigil expressed renewed commitment to seeking justice for Tara, and with this new development, there was finally hope that answers might be on the horizon. The case of Tara Calico remains one of the most haunting, unsolved mysteries in the United States, a tragic story that has left a family searching for closure and a community grappling with unanswered questions. The FBI, too, has never given up, offering a reward of up to $20,000 for any information leading to Tara's discovery or the arrest of those responsible. Her story has been featured on television programs like Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted, keeping her memory alive in the hopes that someone, somewhere, might know what happened on that September morning so long ago. As we look back on this case, we see a story of a young woman full of promise, an ordinary morning turned tragic, and a community's relentless pursuit of justice. Tyra Calico's disappearance may still be shrouded in mystery, but the search for truth continues, a testament to the enduring love and commitment of those who refuse to let her story fade away. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Thank you for listening.